Okay, shall we? Okay. <clears throat> so, um, as I was saying, there's a converse to the result I was uh, stating on uh, reconstruct census reconstructability holds if you're above this Kesten stigma threshold. And so, uh, here's a kind of converse assume uh, <clears throat> a specific. Uh, uh, low for the number of children uh, in your branching process, assume Poisson of alpha, say, uh, for the distribution of the number of children. Assume you're below this Kasten Stigum threshold, so alpha times lambda 2 of p uh, in modulus squared is less than one. Uh, then the mutual information between the spin at the root and the census vector vanishes. Okay. Uh, and I stated here for Poisson on distributions, but this is more general. In fact, this holds for quite a large family of uh, offspring distributions. Uh, so uh, why is it referred to as the kesten stigum uh, threshold? Well, this is because it uh, <coughs> derives from some results established by uh, Harry Kesten and uh, his colleague Stigum in, in the 60s in a paper entitled Additional Limit Theorems for Indecomposable Multidimensional Galton-Watson Processes. Okay. So what they were looking at uh, was multidimensional branching processes, which is really what we have here. They were looking at a slightly more general uh, family of uh, multi-type branching processes, but here it's like we have a, 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 gen a genealogical tree and we have Q species, the species corresponding to a trait. So we really are dealing with a multidimensional branching process. And so uh, there's a, a kind of a law of large numbers that you can have in those multidimensional branching processes. If they tend to survive, then the uh, 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 census vector tends to blow up exponentially fast, all right? And so if you normalize the number of individuals at generation D with trait S by alpha to the minus D, then you tend to approach new sub S, so that's the stationary probability for trait S with your uh, uh, probabilistic mechanism, your stochastic matrix P. So they, they looked at deviations from this uh, uh, large, uh, low of large numbers behavior. So they looked at what happens when you take your census vector, you subtract the thing predicted by this law of large numbers, and then you scale uh, down by uh, some uh, variance or uh, rather standard deviation parameter. And in that case, that turns out to be alpha to the minus d over two at generation d. Okay. And so uh, it turns out that uh, uh, there's not a universal behavior for the limit of these uh, random vectors. There's a dichotomy, and the dichotomy is the predicted by this Kesten Stigum threshold, it's exactly uh, uh, given by whether uh, alpha lambda 2 squared is above one or below one. And when it's below one, uh, it turns out that the distribution of this rescaled uh, uh, vector converges to a Gaussian, multidimensional Gaussian, that is uh, <coughs> uh, not dependent on the spin of the root node. So you can consider branching process conditioned on the value of the spin uh, at the root node. And uh, that gives you a limit uh, in distribution. And this limit in distribution below the Keston stigma threshold does not depend on the, on the uh, spin uh, of the root node. Uh, OK, so there's a, a, a limiting distribution that is ga Gaussian and that does not depend on the spin at the root node. Uh, so uh, we can strengthen that quite a bit. So uh, convergence in distribution to a limiting distribution, uh, this is equivalent. Uh, so this, this is uh, according to the theory of a weak convergence in probability theory. This is equivalent to convergence in the Levy-Prokhorov metric. And there's a theorem due to Strassen, which tells you that if you have convergence in distribution of two sequences of random variables, then you can uh, construct a coupling of these two variables such that with high probability they are uh, close by, okay? So we can 
translate this uh, convergence and distribution result to a, a, a coupling result saying uh, if I condition uh, according to the uh, value at the root, the spin, whether it is tau or tau prime, I look at my uh, census vectors uh, x at depth d conditioned on tau or conditioned on tau prime. I can make this coupling such that the probability that they exceed epsilon times alpha to the d over two goes to zero uh, for any epsilon, epsilon, okay? And uh, uh, I can actually uh, uh, use that and beef it up if I, if I uh, take this coupling at generation d, now from these uh, coupled census vectors, I'll construct the census vectors at generation d plus one in a coupled manner. And so here the proof is simpler if you assume Poisson distribution for the number of offsprings because Conditionally, on the census at generation D, the number of individuals of a given spin at generation D plus one is a Poisson random variable. And for distinct spins, they are independent. So these are uh, nice properties of Poisson distribution. And this allows you to show a stronger result at generation D plus one, namely that uh, you have a, a, a coupling of the census vectors at generation D plus one, such that with high probability, the two are equal not just, uh, uh, yes, they are equal, not just distinct. Uh, so uh, this is a, a coupling which uh, establishes that the distance in variation between the two distributions uh, goes to zero. So I, I guess some of you have heard about distance in, in variation of a random, between random variables. So anyhow, so I'll also give a pointer to lecture notes if you want to, to uh, fill in details that I'm going over uh, quickly. Uh, and so uh, that's what gives you the, the result because there's a, a simple uh, derivation which allows you to show that in that, in that particular case, uh, the mutual information between the spin at the root and the census vector can be upper bounded by a constant time the supremum uh, over distinct values for the spin at the root of the variation distances between the distributions of the corresponding census vectors at, uh, at generation D. So if this goes to zero, then the mutual information goes to zero, and that's how we can get the converse to the Kestens degree. Okay, so we have a, a, a good understanding, if you like, of the onset of a, a census reconstructibility. This is predicted by this Kestens degree threshold. So let me uh, move back to the first question I was asking, which was uh, tree reconstruction and I'm giving myself a lot more information. I'm giving myself the whole tree and uh, I know precisely which node at generation D gets which spin, not just the summary statistics. Uh, so, uh, all right. Um, Right, so the mutual information between the spin uh, at the root and uh, the tree as well as the spin at generation D is uh, given by the conditional distribution of the uh, uh, root spin, uh, knowing uh, the spins at generation D. So let me denote by uh, new hat uh, this corresponding conditional distribution. We know that uh, 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 this mutual information is a function of this uh, new hat, all right? And so uh, how do we compute in practice this uh, conditional distribution? Uh, well, uh, we have a very nice uh, conditional independence property in this uh, 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 model that uh, when we know the, uh, <coughs> the spin at one node, the spins downstream and the, stream and the spins upstream are independent. And we have, in a sense, a, a Markov random field over a tree. And in such Markov random fields, conditional distributions can be computed efficiently using the so-called uh, belief propagation algorithm. Uh, so we can, we can follow that way. And so in order to determine the conditional distribution of the spin at the root, given the spins at layer D, we can move up the tree and for each node uh, in between, I compute the conditional distribution of that guy's spin given uh, its descendants at that layer. And so that's the, uh, that's the belief propagation algorithm. And so you can figure 
out for yourself that because of these uh, conditional independence properties, then the conditional distribution of the spin of node i, uh, given its descendant within layer d, so maybe a picture is, uh, is in order here. So I have r here, I have i here, and then I have uh, sigma j uh, a node d. And so these are those guys that are I conditional, all right? And I can compute recursively those quantities using this uh, belief propagation equation here. Uh, one remark uh, uh, that is important is that they admit a trivial fixed point. If I plug in within this equation, the uh, stationary distribution, this is a fixed point. What I, I, this is not what I will do if I'm given the spins at layer D. I will plug the true values, and so I will uh, inject Dirac masses at the true values as distributions, and then I iterate and get distributions. These will be random distributions because they are functions of the spins uh, below. Uh, but that's belief propagation. So uh, it turns out to be a, po a powerful analytic uh, analysis tool in order to uh, understand the onset of uh, reconstructibility uh, uh, in the following way. Um, so knowing uh, that we can use this belief propagation equation to compute the conditional distributions, then uh, we can uh, uh, determine iteratively the distribution of this conditional distribution at layer D. Okay, so this is a, a random distribution. It admits a distribution. So this is a distribu probability distribution on distributions on a set of size Q. And we can, using a belief propagation, uh, uh, determine precisely what is the law of... Uh, uh, so I'm writing Q tau D for the distribution of the conditional distribution of the spins uh, at the root given its true value is tau, and I observe spins at uh, uh, depth d. Uh, and so uh, uh, just a consequence of belief propagation is the so-called density evolution equation, which uh, uh, characterizes how this q tau d evolves uh, as I increase d, okay? Uh, so that's uh, one way of writing it. I'm, I'm not spending too much time on it, but this is really something you can figure out by thinking about it without calculations, just a consequence of belief propagation. Uh, it admits an unconditional version. You can uh, ask what is the distribution of the conditional distribution of the spin at the root without making any uh, conditioning on this value of the spin at the root. So it turns out that this unconditional law is an average of the conditional distribution Q uh, at tau d I was writing. And so you can uh, similarly uh, deduce from the previous one a, a fixed point, uh, well, uh, an evolution equation for this uh, distribution of a distribution as you move it. Uh, so as I said, uh, belief propagation admits a trivial fixed point, that is the, the uh, stationary distribution new. And so we know that uh, this uh, density evolution equation that I have summarized as uh, uh, formally, you have Q hat D plus one is function Psi of Q hat D. If you use for Q hat D, uh, uh, the Dirac mass at nu, then you get uh, Dirac mass at nu at the, as the output, okay? So uh, that's a trivial fixed point. And it turns out that uh, uh, working a little bit more, we can, we can uh, get a characterization on whether there is reconstructibility or not. Uh, the, the necessary and sufficient condition is as follows. Uh, there is reconstructibility if and only if this uh, fixed point equation admits another non-trivial fixed point besides the trivial fixed point. So there's one direction which is easy, which is uh, uh, if, uh, what is the easy direction again? So you remember we had these conditional distributions new hat. We know they converge as we, uh, by the backwards Martingale convergence theorem, as I get less and less information because I get to see spins that are further down the tree. So this is 
a decay of information, I get a limit to that. And I know that I have uh, 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 for the limit a fixed point. So the distribution of the limit will be a fixed point for this uh, 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 recursive equation. And so if there is only one fixed point and this is the Dirac mass at nu, then the fixed point at the limit will be uh, the Dirac mass at nu, which means that the conditional distribution of the spin at the root converges weakly to the uh, distribution nu, and this is the same as not, not having reconstructivity. So uniqueness of the fixed point implies non-reconstructivity. And you need to work a bit more. If you have a fixed, uh, a fixed point that is not trivial, then you can massage it a bit and construct a statistics that will allow you to uh, uh, get meaningful information, non-vanishing information about the, the root trend. Okay. Um, and well, no, it's it's not like that. It's uh, you know, there's a fixed point that is not trivial, and so you forget about belief propagation and you use this fixed point and you, you say, okay, I'm going to move to pass this, to construct a statistic like I was constructing a statistic based on the eigenvector for census reconstruction. You construct a statistic that you can propagate upwards and this will give you uh, something that is correlated with the uh, spin at the So in a sense, you, you don't use uh, vanilla belief propagation, you use something slightly different and then that works out nicely. So, uh, yeah, so the, the idea of that was uh, uh, given in a paper by Marc Mesar and Andrea Montanari in 2006. Uh, and they looked at specific setup, but it, the, the idea generalizes nicely to a more general branching processes, non-uniform uh, stationary distributions and, and, and so on. What are you saying is for I guess that in this true reconstruction problem, if you run BP, you get as much information as there is. Yes, so this, because it's exactly the same. Yes, yes. Do you, you have no loss of information. So this uh, other line of argument tells you there is information that you can access by doing this computation. This implies that BP does carry some information in that tree model. So when we move to uh, non-tree models, uh, all hell. Uh, Right, yeah, but I was saying it was for non -tree. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yes. Okay. Um, so, uh, are these two problems, reconstructibility and non and uh, census reconstructibility, equivalent? Well, no, they aren't. There's a paper by Alan Sly in 2011 where he looks at uh, Q airy models. So, uh, he looks at uh, a Q, the number of spin values uh, 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 larger than four, and he looks at regular trees. So there's a number of uh, children that is the same for all and everyone. It's a B, a constant, an integer. And he shows that for Q larger than four or equal to four, you can uh, uh, find uh, parameters where you have a reconstruction, but not census reconstruction. And this is a, a very tough, uh, he used Mathematica to pass, well, to produce a string of formulas. And it's, it's not uh, human readable, this paper. I think there are, but that's the first uh, uh, statement of that kind. Okay, and so for those in the room who are uh, proficient in, in, uh, uh, in cavity method, I guess this uh, uh, density evolution equation is, is really uh, familiar to you. 
So this is something that is central in the cavity method in statistical physics. And this is also very important in the theory of uh, uh, error correcting codes. Uh, okay. So with this, I will move uh, to uh, uh, my uh, graph models on which I want to do community uh, uh, detection and reconstruction. So graph clustering. And we'll see that there is a, a strong tie with the models we have been seeing. So something I, I was mentioning uh, during the break, uh, those uh, uh, tree models and those reconstruction models have been looked at by experts in genetics. Uh, they, they had problems of that kind. They were, they, they were really the ones who uh, proposed this kind of uh, questions. Uh, that's not my motivation here. That's more uh, in light of what we are going to look at now. Okay. So uh, we are going to look at graph clustering, but not at uh, any graph clustering. We'll look at uh, uh, graphs that come from a generative model that will be the stochastic block model, uh, which is a, a, a well-known and popular model of a random graph. Uh, and so uh, here's how it's, uh, it's constructed. Uh, you have n vertices. Uh, you will assign to each of them a spin at random. Uh, and let's uh, call new the distribution with which we, we sample the spins. And let's assume there are Q values for the spins. And so we, we see the same notations as in the previous problem. Uh, having uh, assigned spins to the, uh, to the nodes, we decide whether to put edges between uh, two distinct nodes, and we do so at random. So for a pair of nodes of spins uh, uh, S and T. So where is that on my slide? Uh, so yes, OK. I and J, let's say they have spins uh, sigma equals S and sigma J equals T. Then I'll put an edge between them with probability that scales like 1 over N. But the uh, numerator is this uh, RST term which is uh, PST, so which is uh, uh, the weight in a stochastic matrix, PST, times alpha from some alpha that is a, a, a parameter characterizing the uh, uh, density of edges in my graph and divided by nu t, okay? Uh, so, uh, and the way to think of it is uh, to uh, look at, the adjacency matrix of this graph. So this is a nine n by n matrix with zeros and ones. Uh, well, if we condition on the spin values of uh, the nodes, then uh, for, uh, and we uh, stack the nodes according to uh, their spins. So we'll have a block structure for the conditional expectation of the adjacency matrix, uh, knowing the spins. So for spin S and spin T, the probability of an edge is the same, whatever the nodes. So we have a block, uh, a homogeneous block here that comes from this, uh, this uh, generative model. And so uh, it's convenient because when we ask, uh, can we uh, cluster nodes according to their statistical properties? Well, we have a planted model where uh, the, the clusters we are looking for, they are uh, part of the model. So we know that's what we want to get at. We want to retrieve the spin values in this model. Okay, and so, uh, yeah, let me finish uh, this. So uh, the way to look at, uh, at this is to say, we have a graph characterized by its adjacency matrix. So this adjacency matrix is a, a block structured model plus some noise. And so we, we want to get at the, uh, at the block structure uh, and uh, find our way through the noise to the block structure. So in a sense, this is very close to uh, uh, things you've heard throughout the week, uh, random matrix theory, uh, low rank deformations of, of matrices uh, and, and so on, except that here we have a, a rather specific noise model because the entries in the end are zeros or ones, okay? So a couple more comments about this generative model, this SBM as I parameterized it. Uh, if I look at uh, the average degrees of nodes uh, conditional on their spin, so here I'm, uh, I'm conditioning on the spins of everyone, okay, in the graph, so sigma 
underscore uh, bracket n is uh, the vector of spins. So conditionally on the spins of everyone, uh, what is the uh, degree of node i? Uh, well, you can just uh, uh, distinguish according to the spins of the other nodes. So you have roughly a uh, new s times n nodes with spin, uh, with spin s. Uh, the probability that uh, you get to connect node i uh, with uh, such a node is uh, uh, alpha p sigma i s divided by n times new s by definition of my model. So it's, it's all uh, on purpose that I parameterized it that way. And so the, uh, in the end, I get something that is uh, uh, approximately alpha. And this is approximate because, okay, there are uh, close to new S times N nodes with spin S, but this is a low of large number phenomenon and there are fluctuations. So this is why it's not an equality. Uh, so I'm parameterizing things to make my life miserable. So it's very uh, hard to find the clusters. It's harder, let's say at least when uh, the average degrees conditioned on the spins are the same because I cannot hope to uh, distinguish clusters by just uh, looking at the magnitude of the, the uh, neighborhoods, the numbers of neighbors, okay? Uh, so I'm, I'm looking at difficult scenarios here. Um, so what, one uh, other word about this uh, model, uh, one matrix that will be uh, uh, extremely important is one matrix that is called the mean progeny matrix and uh, uh, it's a Q by Q matrix. And so the entry ST for two spin values S and T of uh, this mean progeny matrix is just alpha times uh, the corresponding entry in the uh, uh, stochastic matrix P, okay? And something that was on the previous slide that I forgot to uh, uh, say is that we assume uh, we have this uh, reversibility relation, new SPST equals new T PTS. And this is necessary if I want the probability of putting an edge between nodes with spin S and T to be something that is symmetrical in S and T, okay? All right, so uh, why mean progeny? Well, uh, as we'll see, this model is closely tied to the uh, tree model. Uh, the, so a multi-type branching uh, a model that we were describing previously. Uh, and so the mean progeny matrix uh, has for its entry ST, the average number of children of type T that uh, uh, an individual of type S gets. And in the random graph, this is the average number of uh, spin T neighbors that a uh, spin S uh, node gets, okay? So that's for terminology. Um, Okay, so uh, let's let's uh, define our uh, objectives in this in this framework. So uh, first definition uh, is that of overlap. So uh, the overlap between a vector of estimated spins, so sigma hat i, the estimate of spin uh, at node i that I construct from my observed graph. So the overlap of this vector of estimates with the uh, true uh, values of the spin, well, it's just uh, a rescaled and centered uh, uh, evaluation of the number of values that I get right, okay? So I could count how many spins I get right, divide by n, so that's the fraction that I get right, and then subtract, uh, let's say, the supremum over s of new sub s, so that if I say everyone has spin one or everyone has spin 10, uh, I get zero at, at best, okay? So that's to get something that becomes positive only when I do something non-trivial. Uh, and there's one more thing in this distribution. So uh, the, the names of the blocks or of the spins have absolutely no meaning in that model. So uh, uh, we need to uh, uh, take care of this in the, indeterminacy, we cannot hope to estimate properly the, the name of the, uh, of the blocks. So we maximize over the, uh, uh, we maximize over permutations uh, of the spin names, uh, our measure of uh, uh, 
the fraction of correctly predicted spins. So that's this maximum of our permutations pi in the symmetric group of our Q elements. And so I'm counting uh, subsets if pi of sigma i equals sigma hat i. Okay, so that's overlap. So uh, from this, I get a first uh, uh, definition. Uh, I'll say that uh, reconstruction is feasible and uh, if I can uh, produce estimates sigma hat i from the observed graph uh, that uh, ensure that with high probability, the corresponding overlap is uh, uh, lower bounded away from zero. There is some epsilon, so it's that the probability that I get overlap above epsilon uh, goes to one as n goes to infinity. Uh, and so there's uh, the same definition adding the, the uh, <coughs> qualifier polynomial time. So I'll say that block reconstruction is polynomial time feasible if uh, there is uh, an estimate sigma hat i that achieves uh, non-vanishing overlap that I can compute in polynomial time, okay? Uh, all right, so that's uh, one notion of, uh, of a success or of a reconstruction in that graph model, uh, success of clustering, if you like. There's a weaker notion uh, that I'm, I'm stating for the record and because it's closer to the uh, 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 performance objectives that I was describing in the tree reconstruction model. So we could say, well, uh, rather than uh, aiming at non-vanishing overlap, I could characterize success as uh, achieving non-vanishing mutual information. So that's what this uh, notion of uh, uh, weak reconstruction tries to capture. Uh, but I, I guess I'll not, I'll not dwell on this. We'll be talking mostly about uh, uh, achieving non-vanishing overlap and not bothering with that. So it's not necessarily the case that you have non-vanishing mutual information so the situation uh, as i understand it now is if you have a uh, uh, weak reconstruction and uh, the, uni the distribution nu is uniform then you also have strong reconstruction you can achieve a positive overlap uh, and it's always the case that if you can achieve positive overlap you get weak reconstruction so what I don't know is if uh, new is not uniform and I have weak reconstruction, do I really have uh, strong reconstruction? So we'll not worry too much about that because we will specialize uh, uh, quite often to the case where new is uniform. That, that will not be, this distinction will be relevant then. Okay, uh, so let's, let's try to uh, explain, yeah. Is the weak reconstruction related to uh, like the, the detectability threshold in a sense of uh, being able to distinguish between uh, Erdo Schreni and uh, and uh, SBM generated graph or? Uh, I'm not sure. Okay. I, I think it might be the same as strong reconstruction actually because of the reasons I was, I was alluding to. Okay. okay. So if the distribution nu is uniform, it is the same. Okay. Uh, a priori it could be weaker, but we don't know. And I would, if I had to bet, I would bet it's the same. Okay. I have no proof. Uh, all right. So uh, let's see why, uh, uh, the two, how the two models are related, the model, uh, the stochastic block model and our problem of, uh, of uh, uh, block reconstruction or community detection and the tree model that I was describing uh, uh, previously. Uh, so uh, there's this result uh, about the structure, uh, the local structure in this random graph. So you can pick a node I uh, in the random graph and then, uh, okay, it has a, a spin sigma i. And then you can look at uh, its neighbors. You can look at uh, neighbors of i. And you can carry on. And you can, in fact, look at the ball in the graph distance uh, around i. Uh, 
uh, to distance d okay uh, and uh, now you can uh, attach uh, to each nodes their spins and uh, it turns out that you get a, a tree with nodes decorated by spins and that if you take d not too large so for instance take d as a, a constant times log n for a, a graph with n nodes then the tree that you get here will be in distribution according to the uh, distance in variation very close to the law of the multiplied branching tree we were considering before if i consider uh, the offspring distribution uh, that is uh, Poisson with parameter alpha, which is my parameter for the average number of neighbors. And if I take the very same uh, P matrix for the propagation mechanism of, uh, uh, of spins. And so this is a, uh, this is a well-known result in the theory of random graphs that you have this branching structure for the neighborhoods of nodes in a, neighbor, in a random graph. If you don't look too far from that node with high probability, you get a tree in this uh, non-dense model where the average degree is not too large, it's order one here. Uh, so you get a tree and uh, for the stochastic block model, you get a tree that is a branching tree. So up to vanishing errors for distance and variation. And you can really prove it by induction, constructing your neighborhood as you go. So you can ask how many neighbors do I get with that particular spin? And you know it's a binomial distribution in this model. However, it turns out that the binomial distribution and the Poisson distribution are close by in variation distance. So you can bound the error you make and you assume you, you have coupled the Poisson and binomial distributions successfully uh, and you iterate. And so you can show that with a probability close to one, there's a coupling that succeeds. And so that's how you prove that. So, okay, so the local structure is the same. So that's a good sign uh, why there's a link between the two models. Uh, I'll state another result about the, uh, uh, the structure of those stochastic block models. That's a result that is due to uh, Mosel, Niemann, and Sly that studied those uh, stochastic block models and reconstruction problems in these uh, quite uh, thoroughly. And so they established, uh, let me pass this for you, they established a kind of uh, uh, approximate conditional independence property in those, in those random graphs. So we know that in the tree model, if we look at uh, node uh, i, we look at the tree uh, from this node, assuming it's the root, we look at the spins at some distance d, then whatever happens beyond, is conditionally independent and we have something very similar here so what we have is uh, in the random graph model we look at uh, node i we look at uh, say uh, its d neighborhood and we uh, distinguish uh, so uh, we draw a set of nodes v these are the uh, nodes at distance uh, uh, plus one from the center node here. And so we get uh, W is whatever is left beyond. And so the result says that the conditional uh, distribution of the spin at I given uh, the full graph, as well as the spins uh, at distance D plus one and beyond is very close to the uh, conditional distribution of the spin at i given the graph topology within distance d and the spins at distance d plus one so it's uh, the graph version if you like of the conditional independence property that holds exactly in trees here it holds uh, uh, in the limits so asymptotically uh, um, but this uh, has a first consequence, uh, providing us with a strong link between the two uh, questions of a uh, uh, tree reconstruction on the one hand and uh, uh, block reconstruction in the graph on the other hand. 
so if we put together uh, the two results I was stating, so this uh, approximate conditional independence plus the fact that the distribution of a neighborhood is close to the distribution in a tree, uh, in the, the tree model, then we can uh, uh, get with a, a couple of steps that if the tree reconstruction does not hold, uh, then a weak reconstruction in the graph model cannot hold. Okay, so that's uh, something that goes in this direction because uh, uh, I have no information about that spin if I'm looking at the whole graph and I'm given on top of that uh, the spin values at some large distance d of order log n. And so I need to consider two, two nodes uh, and with high probability there's a uh, no correlation I can guess on their spin values when I observe the graph. So I'm, I'm hand waving a bit here. The, the more rigorous argument is, is uh, sketched on the slide, but that's, that's one, uh, one uh, strong tie between the two models. So non-tree reconstruction implies non-weak block reconstruction and hence non-strong uh, block reconstruction. Uh, okay. So you, you might ask, uh, is this a sharp uh, uh, condition? So uh, for non-reconstruction uh, in the graph model. Uh, so to the best of, of my knowledge, it's, it's, uh, it's not completely settled. Well, it's known that there are some cases where you may have a tree reconstruction and you may not have a graph reconstruction. So graph reconstruction is a stronger uh, requirement than uh, tree reconstruction. And so an example of that kind has been uh, proven uh, in a paper by Koja Oglan, Chakala, Perkins, and Deborova in 17. Uh, and they have a conjecture for uh, what is the, the uh, correct uh, uh, condition for graph reconstruction, but I'm not going to, to try and convey to you to take me uh, uh, out of my comfort zone. And uh, Mark will be telling you uh, about the information theoretic uh, uh, reconstruction problems that are really a, a parallel to what I'm, I'm describing here. Uh, so you, you'll get to see uh, some of that in his, uh, uh, in his lecture. Okay. Um, okay, so... Uh, Let's uh, uh, now discuss a little bit about uh, algorithmic approaches for uh, clustering our graphs. So the uh, basic vanilla uh, uh, method for clustering graphs is a spectral method where you take usually uh, either the uh, adjacency matrix of the graph or the Laplacian matrix of the graph. You uh, do a spectral analysis, you pick uh, a few eigenvectors. So if you are looking at the uh, adjacency matrix, what you typically uh, do is pick eigenvectors associated with eigenvalues with la large modulus. Yeah. That's fine by me, yeah. Okay, let, let's do it. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I had a, a question about the, the first part of your lecture and, and the problem of reconstructing the, the spin at the, at the root, given some information about what happens at, at layer at D. So you made a distinction about whether the mutual information is zero or larger than zero, which, which uh, gives a distinction between a problem that is reconstructable and another one that is not. Um, my question is first, in, in the theorems that, that you proved, uh, are you able to access also the value of the mutual information, the limiting mutual information when it is non-zero or, or can you just prove whether it is zero or non-zero and, and in general, is, is the value, the actual value of the mutual information important in, in any aspect of the, of the theory? So whether the mutual information is, 
in some units is equal to one or 100 doesn't make any any difference so if you normalize for example with the upper bound if it is like 0 0.001 or it is 0 0.999 does it make any difference in in any aspect of of, of the problem uh, i guess it must do some must have some consequence on uh, if you if you are serious about estimating this spin value at the root uh, obviously uh, the properties of your estimate will be affected by this uh, limiting quantity if it's not zero but close to zero you expect it to be worse but i guess the, the people who were serious about that in the tree model were the geneticists uh, who started off this but I'm not aware of any uh, work that you know tries to really uh, quantify the limiting value and deduce uh, useful uh, outcomes from that. But uh, that's uh, and in in the in the theorems that you prove, you can only prove whether it is zero or non-zero, but not the actual value of the limit. So the usual uh, the proof I'm I'm uh, describing uh, for the census algorithm. Uh, the, the proof does not uh, uh, provide you any bounds, so it's you know uh, existential rather. Mm. So it's it's not good in that respect. I guess uh, the one about the uh, fixed points of the uh, uh, density evolution equation should provide you with some quantitative uh, estimates for this limiting mutual information. Uh, so I think this you you could really uh, work out even numerically. You, you, might access that uh, at least uh, but again I, I don't know of anyone who was serious about pushing that further uh, but that's, that's a very good point okay thanks so much yeah, the mutual information has been computed like the actual value for different settings of the sbm uh, uh, yeah so in the sbm case uh, yes the, the results that I know of, there, there's a paper by Montanari and uh, Emmanuel Appé, uh -huh. where they look at uh, degrees that uh, grow. And so they can uh, call upon some uh, Gaussian approximations. And so, then, yeah. you know, they start looking at channels with Gaussian additive noise, yeah. like Mark was describing. Yeah, so actually, in this limit of uh, uh, dense graphs, from the mutual information point of view, the SBM is exactly the model that Mark will be discussing. But like in the sparse case, it's much more uh, hard. And uh, uh, like there is a, so in the disassortative case where uh, nodes tends to be more connected when they are in different groups, there is a, uh, a proof of what the mutual information is. And so that's uh, in the Perkins, the Borla, yes, yes, the, gland paper. Exactly, yes. through cavity arguments. But in the assortative case, like years after years, people get uh, like the formula is the same essentially, but there is always a kind of regime of uh, S of signatures ratio, which is a which measures the difference between the poieties between intra and inter uh, different groups and inside the groups. And it seems that there is a gap that no one is able to close at the moment. And that from- but, but they have a guess that they, they say is exact, but non regals right? Yeah, but-, so, but uh, it's, Isn't it? Uh, I would say six, six, until six months ago, yes. But now I would bet that the formula is actually wrong in this, at least in a certain ah, gap. Okay. There is something really special happening in a, in a spe specific gap. And uh, okay, no, no, it's uh, <laughs> no, no. So it, it's not so so clear uh, in in this assortative case, uh, even at the level of the mutual information, which usually is higher, is easier to access that than, than the overlap. Okay, so yeah, I've tried myself for a very long time and. Uh, I, I lost a lot of time. <laughs> okay. Any more questions? No? Right. See you tomorrow then. Yep, see you tomorrow. Thank you, everyone.